Why would a man who was a slave in a country give up life in America to return to that country? We'll talk about this next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. What do a former slave and a newly formed country have in common? Hope. Our guest, Francis Bach, one of the most famous of today's former slaves, is showing by example. After escaping slavery in Sudan, he settled in the United States, wrote the first contemporary slave narrative, and helped to bring the horrifying story of modern day slavery to millions. But when the part of Sudan where he was born became a new country, South Sudan, Bach could not stay put. Now living in South Sudan, he is dedicated to making the same success out of the still war-torn country that he made out of his own life after slavery. Thanks for joining us today, Francis. Thank you. Tell us about your story, for those who may not have heard, um, the experience you had with, with slavery and how it affected your life. My story is um, a former slave uh, from now two Sudans. Um, I was born in Sudan in the year 1979 in the village of Gorian in South Sudan, uh, northern Barakazal state. At the age of seven, I was kidnapped at a local market and taken to slavery serving the Northern Sudanese men, had his property, um, attending his goats and cattle. Ten years later, after multiple attempts, I successfully escaped and made my way to the capital of Sudan, Khartoum, where I stayed at the refugee camps called Jabarono, with the help of the people in that refugee camps, I was able to make my way to Egypt in early 1998. I spent almost two years in Egypt searching where I applied for the refugee status in the United Nations until I was given that resultman to come to America in late of 1999 as a refugee. So after a long time and all the brutality that I had endured for 10 years in captivity, I decided here in the U.S. to just give an example and to speak out on behalf of millions of men and women, including hundreds of thousands uh, of my own country and my own tribe men and women that are still held in bondage. Can you tell us what a typical day was like during your time in slavery? And it's very hard to describe, and I always shocked and stunned the kids when I talked to the children here in this country, in the United States. They can imagine, because I tell them I was the first one to wake up in the morning and the last one to go to the bed in every single day. I work from sun up to sundown. My, I have no working schedule. I work throughout. I get bitten without any reason or any wrongdoing whatsoever. I was only taught to say yes, even when it's the big no. Everything that I do, I must accept yes, obey to my master and his family members that I work for. So I, I have never had a day of which um, I choose to just sit at home and relax or go do something that is amusive or something that is more entertaining or at least to refresh my mind from the same routine. That has never been uh, an opportunity for me. Um, different day, but all the same story, the same environment, the same routines. 
So regular beatings, and where did you live? Where did you stay? What was your? Um, I was actually living near the cattle uh, camp. Um, and that small shelter is my designated area just for me, as it has been designated for the animals. So I was treated like animals, like an animal. And perhaps I was even treated worse than that because I learned that my master and his wife and the family member cares of their animals. When one goat went missing, they would beat me all of a sudden and force me to go and look after that goat and bring it back home. But they never came to me and asked how I slept last night, uh, what, what other thing that I would like to do other than just always being after the cattle. That kind of privilege has never been given to me. So I was treason, uh, treated less. I was absolutely dehumanized and made like, like those animals and even worse. So not surprisingly, you tried to escape. And, and what happened during that first attempt? Well, my first attempt was um, I, I made it, I, I just decided this is just seven years after I'd been there. I was taken there at age of seven. And during that seven years, I served with this family. I had learned and I come to the conclusion that no matter how hard and how long I would serve these people, work for these people, they would never ever going to appreciate or recognize what I do for them or value me and my effort. So I decided to skip the first time, like usual, uh, time that I woke up in the morning, around four in the morning, that's when I woke up. And I just decided to run. And I was running, just heading toward force. And I was caught back by my mother's cousins, his name Ahmed. When I was brought back home, I was beaten. My master beat me and threatened me then not to skip again. But in my heart, I said I'd rather die than be a slave because I hate the way they treat me and also the way they treat other slaves. Just four days before I escaped, my master took me to one of his cousin's home where I seen a young boy, same age as I, a Dinka man who was from the same tribe that I, I held from, who was actually tortured. His master is one of the richest guys with the camels in the area, and this young boy was sick. They can see it and smell it, but he was not given a time to just go and check himself, be treated in the hospital, or just at least stay at home. So he refused to go to work that day, and his master said he was a lazy boy. So what he did, he tortured him. He was in balance. He cut out one his left leg and his right, um, I mean, shoulder. So that I seen this boy and I said, look, these kind of things, and I was taken there intentionally to see what will happen to me because there's a, one of the day I complained that I never have any day off. Um, and my master said, you have no day off. And you are here to do what I ask you to do. Period. So when I'd seen that young man, with the way he was, I said, I better run away before it happened to me. So that's why I escaped. However, after that first attempt, and I was warned not to do it again, I only waited for two days. The second day, I left about the same time in the morning, but my master became very suspicious of me. So he watched me while I was stepping out from my small shelter where I stayed. He allowed me to walk maybe about a mile or two, and then he got on his horse, the fastest horse that he does not ride, only when there is an op important occasion. And I remember when Juma came, uh, my master, he told me to stop. And I stopped and he told me to lie down on my chest and give him my hand and my leg behind me. And he has a rope. So he tied me and I would drag back uh, to the house. And I thought, I thought that that was going to be the end of my survival. 
and uh, when we got home, I can still watch my own blood running. And, and I stopped crying. I cried, even I couldn't cry anymore. And uh, his wife, Hawa, the sooner we got home, he said, don't waste no time. Let me kill him just like a chicken. I could just grab a knife from the kitchen and kill him. And indeed, she could have done that because I was tied up anyway. And, um, and, I, and at the time, Juma spoke to me saying, today is going to be your last day on the earth. I will kill you. Um, I remember I was hearing him speaking, but I was hearing my own self also talking. Just bending my head down and saying, God, please don't let him kill me. I love my parents. I have hope in the future. So I prayed, and while I was listening on the other side, Jim, what Jim is saying and about to do, I remember he stood in front of me for quite a few minutes until he walked away. And next few hours, he came back and he warned me before he releases my leg and my hands. And he said, I'm going to release you. But I must warn you, the last warning, if you attempt to escape again next time, I will not waste even a second to talk to you. I will just kill you. So I promise him and I swear to him that I would never ever again do it again. Yes, I knew it was a very dangerous attempt for me. So I waited for three more years until when I turned age of 17 years old. In 1996, I said I'm a grown up man now. I'm 17 years old. I will do what it takes. I will run away again, but if anybody caught me, or even my master himself, I will resist. I will not give up, because I hate the way they treated me and the way they treated other slaves. So my third, which was the final attempt, three years after the two attempts, I was successfully uh, made it through at the town called Matari, where I was helped there by the truck driver, lorry driver, and made my way to Khartoum, the capital. As I mentioned earlier, and that's how I ended up in the refugee camps, Jabarona, and eventually with the help of other uh, tribe men, I was able to make my way to Egypt. And everyone looked at me, maybe like a street boy, because I was dirty and just sitting there not having water or anything until finally one of the Egyptian guy came and asked me, Samara, uh, that's the name they call us, you know, why you been sitting here? Because he's a tech, so I've been going and coming back. And I said, I've been here. They have this heavy accent, Egyptian accent, but I still communicate with them because I speak Arabic very well. And he said, there are people like you when they come. They, there's a church called Sikakini in Abbasia. When you like, I can take you there if you can pay me. And I said, I don't have money. So the guy went back twice. He said I was maybe um, just not wanting to pay him. I said, I have no money. I've been here since morning. You see me sitting in the same place, not even eating or drinking. That means I have no money. And I appreciate this gentleman. I didn't ask his name. So he took me to this church uh, called Sikakini in Abbasia area, where I spent the next 22 days. And they have to hang my name outside in front of the door, along with many other Southern Sudanese men and women who came to Egypt and can't afford to pay rent or knowing anybody because we are all running away, just rescuing our own self. Because when you get to Egypt, you had an opportunity to apply for the refugee status, whether to come to America, Australia, UK, or Canada. And I was remaining there until late of 1999. My name came out after a lot of process. It's not easy to come to America. You have to pass every single test. There are translators, there are people that help. Um, so I made it to USA and my first home in the United States was Fargo, 
North Dakota. That's where I was uh, my sponsor base, uh, Luden Social Services. Until May of 2000, I was persuaded by um, this abolitionist American from New Jersey, but moved to Massachusetts, uh, is named Dr. Charles Jacobs, who was one of the co-founder of human rights organization based in Massachusetts, uh, American anti-slavery group. So he heard of me from other refugees from South Sudan who live in, in Boston, is named Franco Majok. And Franco actually helped me write my story when I was in Egypt, because he's an English teacher. He went to school in Egypt, and those were the people they're helping, are the refugees from South Sudan. So you joined that organization, you wrote your book, uh, The First Contemporary Slave Narrative, and you are now recognized as an abolitionist uh, around the world. But then your country had a civil conflict, and now the new state of South Sudan has been formed. And even though you were comfortable here, you decided to go back. What, what made you decide to go back? Well, a um, great thing. It was a great opportunity for my people. And I, I, I feel when we uh, raised that flag of new, the world new state, number 193rd in the world and number 54th in the continent of Africa, and I was so happy, I was overwhelmingly happy and joyful for that moment to witness in my own and for my people all men and women, they couldn't believe that we have made it. Um, that struggle and that, you know, uh, long battle to form our own country that will recognize both men and women of that state equally as all equal citizens. No categorization where you have first and second and third class, like when we were third class citizen in the whole country of Sudan. But now South Sudan represented us equally like this. And with all its tribes, we are all you know, respected, treated equally with the same dignity and prosperity. So I decided to move back and I was there. I went just a night before the the declaration of South Sudan become the one new states. I arrived, I left here in the United States on July 7, 2011, and I arrived July 8, because it take literally two days to get to South Sudan. On the 9, I witnessed, I spent all day there, and I was there with American journalists. I took journalists with me, and they were there with me, and I told them I want this to be a part of history, and they're helping me now. Um, with a trailer to have a documentary out about this. What made me to go back? Because I knew that brand new country needs um, a lot of help. And me, although I'm a dual citizen of this country, the United States of America, the country of which I'm very, very proud of. I'm very proud of its citizens that have given me and my people and other immigrants, a second chance of life to relive our dreams again, I thought that I would serve both country to the best in any way that I can as individual. But South Sudan needed me most because that country lacks a lot of things. And I live there comfortably, but what I'm not comfortable, every time I go around, just about five miles away from the capital of South Sudan, Juba, and you see how vulnerable our people are still. Not having light, streets, uh, hospitals, good schools. People are just struggling and drinking from the river. No clean water. And there's no way you could buy water, clean water, and give it to one family, maybe in one day. But next tomorrow, they will have to go back to the river. And diseases are I don't even know what people are, ever, when you go to the hospital, typhoid, malaria, you know, cholera, all these diseases because of the environment that my people are in.
So I went back um, to South Sudan and I was able to work for, I'm not working for the government, uh, a construction company called ABMC. It stands for Aggregate Building Material Company. Um, that helping to pave way and construct roads. And we have pretty much constructed um, many of the roads that are available in Juba, the capital of South Sudan. And we are inspired and we are looking forward to um, doing that, interconnecting our cities, towns, and states, 10 states of South Sudan, because South Sudan has 10 states um, that made up that country of South Sudan. So that is the job I'm doing as a public relations manager, and that is to use my connections and relationship. I hope for those that I lost their contact and friend of my people then and my friends to really come to South Sudan and invest in all different sectors. You know, South Sudan now welcomes all the investors from all walks of life, and particularly from the United States, because I call the peace that the people of South Sudan are enjoying, and even in the Sudan, and those brothers in Darfur, Nuba Mountains, Southern Blue Nile, and Eastern Sudan, Bija, those who have struggled with us and continue to struggle for their, and not to forget, the people of Bia, Dinkangok, who are my tribe, where their region, one of the richest region with the oil, and Khartoum invaded it just a few months before we became independence in May 2011. I'm talking here about the most complex situation. I don't know how I could best all address it because everybody, everybody need support. But I will focus at this point that South Sudan is the most area that need to be rescued from all improprieties that are going on. You know, we need, you know, people to come and teach us, train us, because technocrats is actually lacking that country. Um, our government is trying its best, um, but we need more experts. Uh, we need more investors. So I may not recommend you to go to this area still troubling now, have issues and insecurity, but South Sudan is absolutely safe. Any state in South Sudan or the capital of South Sudan, Juba. So I'm really extending this you know, friendly invitation to anybody. I have no mandate from the government to, to say what I'm saying here, but I, I feel that it's what needed. It's what my uh, country lacking. It is the reason why I work for this construction company, you know, to reach out to our friend and say, hey, I work for this company now. We construct roads, but we'd like to partner with you. Come, do whatever you feel you want to do. We will actually make sure that you are being welcome and settled and do what that you can do to be a part of a nation building. I think that's very inspiring. And when you were enslaved, you never gave up on hope. And now you're bringing that same spirit to helping a new country stand up. And that must feel like something very, very special to you. Yes, I, I never actually uh, given up in anything. I always believe that, you know, uh, persistency, you know, is what make people succeed. You, you must actually stand tall. Even if you're weak outside, you must stand strong inside. I have been through that, you know, when I was in captivity, I was weak from the outside, but from inside, I'm always strong, even today. And thank you for standing strong, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF.